Now that we've looked at exactly what kind of idle turn animations come to make a full 360 degree range of motion, let's go ahead and look at retargeting and how we can use the, in this example, simple skeleton setup with our rigid body mannequin to be able to use those animations so maybe your proportions are different but you'll be able to basically rehouse those animations on your own custom skeleton and not have to worry about having an animator create them for you. So inside of this we have our mannequin character and it's a typical CryEngine setup. You have scene root, root, we have the mesh and the skeleton and then we also have the physics proxies. If I were to turn them on you would see exactly the ragdoll, the ragdoll skeleton slash mesh and then the live hitbox mesh. So it's nothing different that we have here. And what we're going to do is we're going to import. So let's go to import. And we're going to take the idle turn 45 left. Now these animations are supplied for you. And you'll notice right away that it's not just a normal mesh. I've actually made it an HIK mesh for you so that you'll be able to use the HIK skeleton on anything you're doing. So if I grab one of these effectors, we have full IK range of motion. So it's not just the animation, but it's also giving you the ability to change that as well. So coming over to the side here, we can see that we have source root, and almost all of the animations that I give you are going to have source on the front of them because I don't want to have any namespace clashes or the chance of it even. So if I rename them all, there's no chance that you'll overwrite the data because it would be both named root. And if I drop this root into here with the same name, it would actually take over the animation or the keyframes from this and plant them on the root skeleton that we don't want to touch. So what we're going to do is, in some theory, create constraints. And inside of the root we have, we don't have any constraints. It's just a blank skeleton. So if I fold that back up, and remember, if you hold down Shift and you click this, you can unfold it all. And then when I open it back up, we'll be able to see the base skeleton. So I want to bring it back to the point where we kind of see the exact same thing. You'll notice we have the spinal one, left thigh, right thigh, pelvis root. So what we want to do is we want to take this data and we want to make sure this is the parent of this slave. So to start out, let's just do something like the pelvis. If I select the pelvis here, remember, parent, child. So the first one I'm selecting is the parent. The second one is the child of the pelvis. And in the rigging tab, you want to make sure you have it selected. We'll go to constrain and we want to go to parent. Let me go ahead and reset the settings to make sure everybody has the exact same thing. And inside of this, we have the constraint axes. You also have maintain offset. You want to have this click. That way it doesn't snap back to the exact positioning. So we're going to constrain the actual positional data and the rotational data. The one thing to keep in mind is maybe we don't want to constrain the uh, up-down motion. So we can constrain only the X and Z motion. So that would be a case of constraining it. For the sake of the tutorial, let's just constrain all of them, and then that way we have a proper pelvis. So I'm going to click Apply, and in doing so, you'll notice that we have a pelvis underscore parent constraint. And if I were to move the timeline now, we would have our skeleton moving in the exact same spot. So this is the basic idea of positional constraints. But the key in this that makes it very, very powerful is just doing rotational constraints because then we can move the positioning. So on the thigh, let's go ahead and do a L thigh on both of them, but this time we're going to go to constraints, and we're going to actually go back to the parent constraint, and we're going to unclick translate. So now we're only taking in the rotational data. So I'm going to do the same for both of the thighs, and then I'm going to actually scroll open both of the legs, because then we'll be able to see it getting really powerful. So I'm going to go ahead and click these really quickly. You can also script these, but for the sake of the tutorial and you being able to see it, I've kept them clickable, or we're going to go through each step. So the calf, the foot, and the toe. So now that we've covered both of the legs, we can see that the legs will most likely, if we've done everything proper, follow the spine or the pelvis as best as it possibly can. 
So with everything working properly, we need to actually constrain the root. And the root right here is actually the locomotion locator. If we scroll this open, we can see that we have the locomotion locator here. And what this is going to do is drive the root of the skeleton. So we're going to select this, and we're going to go to parent constraint. And we're actually going to constrain everything except the Y. So we want to do the X and Z, and we'll click Apply. Now if we scrub through this, we can see that our root motion is actually following the locomotion locator as it should to give it an animation-driven presence. And inside of the engine, it'll actually extrapolate this information to be able to create proper movement within the blend space. So in the same regard, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly assign this to both of the arms and then the neck and head, and then we'll look at exactly what we have. And for the sake of the video, I'm not going to do it to the fingers, but you can get a good idea of what your targeting is. So now that we have all the constraints put in together, we can go ahead and play out our animation and see what we have. With this, we're able to have our animation in the relative same spot. We don't have the hands, as I said. You could do the same process for all the fingers, and you would get this. But the key thing to remember is the proportions of this. So if we sc scroll back to the first frame and we unroll this, let's go ahead and close the clavicle. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull this up. We're going to pull it outward. And then we can go in and change the, let's make the forearm really long. He's got like really long arms. We're going to make his head a little bit higher. So we're splitting the difference. And let's change the legs as well. So the thigh, let's move it out to the side. And change it, we'll make the foot come out a lot farther. So now we have a lot of this. This is just really all out there. It, wouldn't, it doesn't even make sense because of everything being where it is. But if I were to go through and scroll this, we can notice that it doesn't actually break the rotational data. So if we were to look at his arms and it was really long, it would mean that the upper arm, it, it works the same way. There's no difference. It's just you're changing the proportions with the positioning of the joints. And that's the key thing to remember about retargeting. For everything except the root, and the pelvis, we're actually just housing rotational values. And this is how motion capture works and how they can take somebody with not exactly the same proportions, but make it work on something else with different proportions because you're only storing the rotational data from the pelvis outward. So this is how we will exactly use the idle turn animations that we had shown previously and being able to house a different proportion but proper blend spaces overall for at least the idle turn animation in this usage. So the next step that we have to do is we have to retarget all of these. We can do it individually like this, or I'm packaging one that has all the animations on the same timeline. So then all you have to do is constrain it to whatever rig you have, and then you can press export, and the animation manager will automatically know what the frames are to push out the I underscore calf to the folder that you've selected. But this basic concept of retargeting is very powerful if you understand how you can use it to your advantage and being able to script it out and make it automated like we do inside of the studio.